First of all, thanks, Melissa, and welcome everyone to the third event in the Women Theater Archives conversation series. It's a real delight to introduce you to our panelists today. I'm going to go in the order they were listed on the event page. Um, so first we have Kinsale Drake who is a Diné writer, narrator, and current senior at Yale University studying indigenous poetics and feminisms. She's a former First Peoples Fund fellow and national student poet, a current in Napo fellow, and the winner of the J. Edgar Meeker Prize for Poetry and the YIPAP Award for Storytelling. Her work has been featured in Time, The Adroit Journal, and NPR among others, and is published or forthcoming in New World Coming, The Languages of Our Love, and her zine, Hummingbird Heart by Abalone, Press, Abalone Mountain Press, excuse me. And you'll have to forgive me um, because these are very esteemed panelists. So there's a lot to, to say about them. Um, Liza Poses is the head of research services and archives at the Autry Museum of the American West and has been working with the Autry since 2005. She holds a part-time faculty position in USC libraries as the LA subject coordinator, a role in which she facilitates collaborative projects with different organizations across Los Angeles and Southern California. Her work in this capacity was recognized by the California Historical Records Advisory Board, winning Lisa the Archival Award of Excellence in 2018. And she's recently curated the What's Her Story, Women in the Archives exhibit, which you can view an online compilation of um, at the Autry's website. Randy Reinholtz, founder and producing artistic director emeritus of Native Voices at the Autry, is an enrolled member of the Choctaw Nation of Oklahoma, a producer, director, actor, and playwright with over 100 productions in the US, Australia, England, and Canada. Um, he has many awards that follow his names, but he's also a professor at San Diego State University, where he served as head of acting, director of the School of Theater, Television, and Film, and director of community engagement and innovation. Jean Bruce Scott, founder and producing executive director of Emeritus of Native Voices at the Autry, has spent 25 years developing new plays, including more than 200 by Native American playwrights. For Native Voices, she's produced 29 plays in 42 productions, 25 new festival plays, eight short play festivals, 16 playwrights retreats, numerous national and international tours, and over 275 play readings. She was instrumental in formalizing the Native Voices Artists Ensemble to mentor and support outstanding and promising Native American actors, writers, musicians, directors, designers, and producers. She's a recipient of many awards herself, including the McKnight Fellowship, a MAP grant, NEA grants, Ford Foundation grant, and many others. Um, and Delena Studi, is a proud citizen of the Cherokee Nation. Studi has over 25 years of experience as a performer, storyteller, educator, facilitator, advocate, and activist. Her theater credits include the Tony Award and Pulitzer Prize winning play, August Osage County, Off-Broadway's Gloria, A Life, and Informed Consent. She's originated roles in 20 plus world premiere plays, including 14 native productions. A pivotal moment in her career was writing and performing And So We Walked, an artist's journey along the Trail of Tears, for which she retraced her father and her family's footsteps along the Trail of Tears. She stars in the Peabody Award-winning film Edge of America, Hallmark's Dreamkeeper, and the TV series Goliath, Shameless, and General Hospital. She is currently the artistic director of Native Voices at the Autry. Okay, that's quite a way to begin our conversation together today. Um, Melissa's already given us some of the credits that come from Native Voices at the Autry. I wanted to share just a little of a little descriptor um, of the work that Native Voices does, and then invite you all to talk about the history, the founding moment um, of this organization. So for our audience members who may not be familiar, Native Voices at the Autry places Native narratives at the very center of the American story in order to facilitate a more inclusive dialogue about what it means to be American. It was founded in 1994 by Randy and Jean, and it is dedicated to the development and production of new works for the stage written by American Indian, Alaskan Native, Native Hawaiian, and First Nations playwrights. Um, it's been called a virtual who's who of American Indian theater artists and a hotbed for contemporary Native theater. Um, it is the country's only equity theater company devoted exclusively to developing and producing new works for the stage by Native American, Alaskan Native, Native Hawaiian and First Nations playwrights. Um, so 
maybe Jean and Randy, can you start us off by um, talking a little bit about the history of Native Voices? I'm curious to hear about the need that it met in its founding moment, um, what the kind of impetus was for, for putting this together and the need it continues to meet, the kind of changing needs that it's adapted to, to meet. So uh, I, we were both professors at Illinois State University and I had directed it for the first time and it went okay and I was pretty excited to direct again and they said that'd be good. And they said, what about something from your culture? And Jean and I said, well, we work in new play development. Surely we can find some native plays. And so we said yes before knowing that that wasn't easy in 1993. And so as we started to look, we were able to meet people and all of a sudden the plays were exquisite, but we were at Illinois State which didn't have a large native population. And then how would we cast these plays? What would they look like in our season? And so we thought we'll just invite the writers to campus and we'll do staged readings and let the writers tell us what they think of seeing our students in these plays. It turned out to be our students and faculty and people from around campus. And it turned into this event and people were really excited to be there. The plays resonated. There was a lot of excitement. And then uh, Bill Yellowrobe, who passed recently, uh, William S. Yellowrobe Jr., said, you know, you should do this again. And we, we were like, well, yeah, I guess we could. We're going to do one of these plays. And that became Native Voices in 1994. Gene, what do you want to add to that? No, that's, that's a great description. Um, we, uh, we thought that it would be very easy to find a Native play. And when it wasn't, um, we were very, very fortunate to have some friends and people that we had worked with in new play development. And so as we called them, uh, they said things like, oh, gosh, a, a, native, a native play. Yeah, no, we don't have any of those. But if you find one, let us know. So mm -hmm. we kind of kept track of all those people. Um, back then, we did not have the internet the way that we have it now. So everything was done by snail mail and by telephone. Um, and we, uh, we went through what at the time was called the Moccasin Telegraph. Um, we, we contacted people and they contacted us back and we said, well, can you put us in touch with this person? And, oh, do you know that person? Um, and then that, uh, those first three festivals that we had, um, we were so lucky because we had the top artistic directors and dramaturgs in the regional theater as our dramaturgs. So Janet Allen from Indiana Rep, Delana knows her very well, she's worked with her. Uh, Roberta Uno from New World Theater. Um, Cynthia White, who at the time was moving into the artistic director at uh, Oregon Shakespeare Festival. Shelley Jiggetts, who was from the public theater. Um, Dolores Chavez from the Mark Taper. Um, Bill Partland, who had a, a wonderful new play development company up in, in Minneapolis. Um, Buffy Sedlicek from uh, Minneapolis Playwright Center. So it was just this, for us as theater folk, it was this wonderful heady group of uh, dramaturgs and then this incredible group of playwrights um, who came. Uh, Marie Clements was at the first one. Um, uh, uh, Bruce King. Drew Hayden Taylor, uh, Hayden Joseph Taylor. Bandaran, Bruce King, and William S. Yellowrope. I mean, it was amazing. And, this, and the next year, Thompson Highway, mm. who was like, you know, the king of Native theater at the time. Um, we got tremendous help from the Canadian uh, group of artists that were up with uh, Native Earth. Um, and then, and also Marco Kane, who was with Talking Stick out in Vancouver. They were 20 years ahead of us in terms of Native theater. So we did not know a single thing that we were doing. <laughs> but we put one foot in front of the other and we called in favors. Those theater companies that I mentioned that were connected to those dramaturgs paid for those artists to come to our festival. We had no money. You know, we raised $2,000 on campus to do this festival and, uh, and they, they, they all came. So that was the beginning. Those were the seeds and that was the beginning. And uh, it's, it's been a joyous journey. All mm -hmm. Yeah, it seems like there was a real hunger um, and perhaps a pivot to, to turn to the developmental side for you all. Um, I'm curious, so someone 
where you all are located. That is an important <laughs> detail. Um, the Autry is located in Los Angeles, but yeah. both beginnings in, in Illinois. Right, thank you. Um, yeah, so I'm curious how quickly did this thing turn into much bigger. You, you talk about the first few years of the festival um, and eventually you were brought into the fold of the Autry. So I'd love to hear a little bit about how that relationship came to be and in what ways were you changed by the relationship to the Autry and in what ways did you change the Autry by coming into relationship with it? Well, this is a, can I tell this silly story, Randy? About... Sure, but quick. <laughs> okay, quick. I have to be quick. I, I, get, I go down the rabbit hole. Um, so um, in 95, we were invited uh, by the Autry to come out and go through their collection. And that came about through another good friend of ours who was a docent at the time. And um, so we came, we flew out and we thought, okay, yeah, let's, let's go look at what they've got. And at that particular moment in time, 1994, 95, um, it was a different institution. And the, Lisa, you can help me here, the, 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 the exhibits and the, the galleries had names like uh, Gallery of Conquest. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, it was all about um, how the West was won, not who was there before anybody else got there. And so as we went through, we, we got very nervous because we thought, well, we can't really comment on this. We need to go. We need to just say thank you very much. So it's a lovely tour, but we need to leave. And the person who was doing the tour uh, said, no, 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 no. We, we want your honest opinion. That's why we want you here. We, we want to know what do you think about the little cards and the, what do you think about the names of the galleries? So we had yellow pads that we had taken some notes on and uh, we told them and they were very open, very grateful. And then within that, that year, they were putting together a panel, uh, Lisa, for powerful images, um, which was uh, about the Native American image. Um, and the idea was how it had been frozen in time and it didn't move, it didn't move with Native people. Um, so they put us on that committee. And then they did the, the book, the galleys for the book, the catalog. And when they sent them to us, they said, well, what's missing? And Randy and I said, well, what else is going on uh, when you open this exhibit? And they said, well, this is it. This is, this is the exhibit. And we said, well, if you don't want them frozen in time, you got to have live people there. <laughs> so you need some music. You need some, some dance. You need theater. You need those things. So um, they invited us to come. Uh, and and we, we submitted three plays, uh, a history play, a, a family-friendly play, and a very hard-hitting um, gritty kind of play uh, that Shelby Jiggets had, had dramaturged for us uh, when we were out in New York. And that's the one they chose, the gritty one by Marie Clements. Mm. Um, opened that play. Uh, LA Weekly said it was the best play ever in Los Angeles. It was a tribute to warrior women everywhere was the quote. Um, and we had packed houses. And so that was the beginning. That's how, that's how we got our foot in the door. Randy, do you have anything to add to that, that story? Lining? Well, just some very imaginative people at the Autry looked at this as a chance to diversify the audience, what was going on, basically what theater's been talking about for the last 15 years, the museum world had been talking about uh, before. And it was fun to see that we could be, play a role in that. Mm -hmm. And I think having native people on campus and around changed the perception of who natives were. This was all before gaming was legalized in California. Mm -hmm. So one of the things, one of the statistics that was quoted is 85% of the audiences that went to Western museums at this period of time thought native Americans were extinct. That was surveyed. So, I mean, it, you think about what's changed in that 25 year sweep. And I think I'm what we're probably more interested in is talking about what the power of this group of artists coming together and changing perceptions and, you know, seeing what's happening in Hollywood now, seeing someone like Kinsale, you know, who's thriving in so many aspects of her career, seeing someone like Delena, who came to us as a young actress, not too long after we started, you know, and I remember 
you know, she was like a baby fawn in some ways. <laughs> she just was get, getting her legs. And she has such power and command. She was always fun to watch. That was always there. But she's a smart, strong, powerful woman changing perceptions of Native people nationally and internationally. Mm -hmm. And that's what a group of artists coming together can do. Well, that's a great invitation, Delena. <laughs> do you wanna, I mean, many of you, your way into this world is through acting. And so I'm curious about the call to go beyond just I mean, not just, you know, representation on screen and on stage is so vitally important, but to work off stage as well, to cultivate, you know, um, and incubate more voices in this world. So I'd love to hear about um, what this role means for you and, and that decision process of moving from acting to artistic directing. Thank you. Um, honestly, it's, it's a full circle for me. Um, I started off as an actor. In fact, the first thing I did at the Autry was I was, an assistant director to Randy for um, a stage reading card, Darlin. And then I became an actor. And what I loved about Native Voices is as an actor, they were developing new plays all the time. So you were in the room as that was happening. So we got to talk with the director and the dramaturgs and the playwright. And so we learned about uh, the structure of a play firsthand from being in the room. And, you know, I was very lucky. I got a, I made a career out for myself through acting, but then I was, asked to create a play and I was like I can't write a play and they're like of course you can you've been working at Native Voices you know you know all the steps and so I I realized you know creating content and having us tell our stories our way is very powerful and so um, I wrote my first play and it was developed by Native Voices and then it went on a tour and so I have to say my my whole career has been shaped by by Randy and Jeannie um, you know my father always said whenever you visit a place know whose land you're on and when you find the native people there, you'll find home. And that's what I did with Native Voices. Mm -hmm. And so for me, I'm now at that stage in my career where I get to give back to the people like me, mm -hmm. the young ones that are coming up who may not have gone to school or had the access to go to school to be a, an actor or a director, but we can teach them at Native Voices. We can hold their hands and guide them through the process and also inspire them to dream bigger. And I, one of the, my favorite things about Native Voices is you know, when we first started, we had, you know, one play and we, it, it'd be amazing to see it there. And now a lot of our plays are, are going out into the world. We're seeing Native Voices playwrights being commissioned by theaters that have never done Native plays before. Uh, and it, that's very exciting to me because for a very long time, we were the only theater where if you were a Native actor, that's the only place you could get work. And we're seeing that change. And so I would not be where I was without the call from Randy and Jean. So I just want to acknowledge that. And just also say that's, you know, we're here for the next generation of storytellers. Mm -hmm. And when I say the next generation of storytellers, I'm not just talking about our young ones. I'm talking about anyone who has always wanted to be a storyteller, but doesn't know how. This year for a short play festival, we had a, a legendary storyteller, uh, Harrison Lowe, who's an, he's one of our elders and he's never written a play before. And so he wrote a play for a short play festival and it was in the top three. And so the fact that this elder who is a master storyteller wanted to find out how to tell a play and he Googled, how do you write a play? <laughs> and then he submitted the play. I mean, that's, that's what we want. We want the next generation, whatever that might be, because all the stories are valid and it's time for our voices to be heard and it's time for us to tell our own stories. Yeah, that's really beautifully said. Um, Kinsale, can I welcome you into this conversation um, as part of, you know, this generation of, of story, Native storytellers? Um, I'm curious about your involvement with Native Voices, and I know that you are someone who thinks critically and practices um, collaborative, you know, processes, right? Like native spaces to create art, um, cultivating those spaces. Uh, so I, I, I'd love to hear about like what the model of Native Voices has done means for you in your career as well. Sure, I can start. <laughs> some of my friends have been asking me about this panel too, because a lot of them, some of them know about like what I was like as like a young artist and some of them don't. Um, but yeah, Native Voices, I first started working at Native Voices when I was 15. I actually celebrated my 16th birthday in a rehearsal for Mary Catherine Nagel's Fairly Traceable. And I remember 
they brought me a cake during the rehearsal and that was like one of my most memorable birthdays but I think first and foremost that to me symbolizes what it provided for me as a young artist who didn't really know what she was doing and I, I also wasn't very aware that Native theater had its own pedagogies and it had its own long genealogies of storytelling and that you know it transcended uh, like American concepts of theater which are inherently rooted in like performance rooted in settler colonialism. Um, and so for me, having a community of artists that young allowed me to see I could do this one professionally. Um, I had so many people to look up to and I had mentors, which are so key to um, helping Native youth. And two, I didn't have to separate my professionalism, quote unquote, from my creativity. Mm -hmm. um, and it's also been really helpful to have experienced like other groups that do Native theater. Um, First Peoples Fund, for example, has really invested in Native theater artists recently. And in their words, some of the artists that were interviewed recently in, 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 in a survey they put out, they explained that they don't identify as like theater artists, they just identify as community members who are practicing traditions um, within their communities. So I think community was really important. I think what Delano was saying about um, the workshop circles, having just all forms of storytelling. So there were like short plays always happening. There were um, acting classes. I remember I was like 15 when I did an acting class with my one of my really good friends at the time, Kenneth Ramos, who I knew from Cornerstone Theater Company. Um, and it just, you really feel like you're part of the process, but also it felt like a family. And to me, I was like, I don't know. I felt like this like little sister that was just tagging along, seeing what everyone was doing. And that really opened the doors, I think, to other programs that I've now, you know, worked with. So that's like EPAP, which is like probably the reason I'm at Yale right now as a student. Um, Mary Catherine Nagel was the executive director of EPAP for many years. And um, I was invited out here as a high schooler to, to perform. Um, and so, you know, on the performance side of things, that's super exciting because that program, you know, is connected to Native voices. And I feel like in Native theater too, there's like a degree of separation everybody has from each other. So actors that I knew from Los Angeles and from Native voices were involved in EPAP and we were performing together here. Um, you had like Native dramaturgs and directors that were all connected like in those ways. Um, and then of course, there's like the investment in Native youth and what that means. And I think recently I've been seeing Native voices kind of push out more, I think probably through digital formatting because of the pandemic, but kind of bringing in Native youth into these circles, um, which I think is really important. And for the most part in college, a lot of my thesis research has centered on um, the importance of storytelling initiatives for Native youth specifically, what that impact has on them as like culture bearers, as members of their communities, how to kind of heal from um, disruptions to kinship methods and storytelling methods that have been disrupted by settler colonialism. Mm -hmm. um, and so my work is, you know, a realm of broadly storytelling, but having supportive and safe spaces for Native youth, showing them that people who are Native can be directors and dramaturgs, and um, basically going beyond also education of majority white audiences, especially mm -hmm. white audiences that can afford to go to theater is also really important. So um, going beyond theater as a form of education to invest in the next generation of native writers and creatives and showing them that it's okay to go back to their communities. It's more than okay. It's how, you know, storytelling was born and was, you know, kind of how we were raised in our communities. It's it, community should be a place where a theater is practiced, not as like purely a mode of performance, but as a mode of kinship and as a mode of sharing and healing. Um, and so I think that's kind of a broad overview of where I came from with Native Voices and kind of the trajectory of where I've come. And I think, yeah, I also want to thank, you know, everybody who was in Native Voices and YPAP and First Peoples Fund, because it's all just kind of this large family or web that provides a lot of support and has allowed me to think about, you know, how do we support Native youth and Native theater through mm -hmm. cultural programming and community programming. Yeah, well, something you say there, Kinsale, reminds me of something I've heard you say, Randy. And Delena, I, I, I've heard you in other interviews talk about your work with incarcerated Indigenous youth and bringing playwriting to them so that they can claim ownership over their stories. Um, so I, I'd love to hear more about those kinds of initiatives and how central they are to the um, you know, mission of Native Voices. But Randy, I, I remember when we talked last, you, you mentioned the ways in which theater itself has to change to accommodate indigenous voices, that it's not just about bringing native people to an already existing form, but about changing the history of that form. Kinsey all talked about you know, settler colonialism as part of that history. And so I'm curious about the ways you've seen theater change during your long career, but also the ways it still needs to change, um, if you'd be willing to share some of that. 
Sure. I, I think I've come to think of theater as it used to be this Cold War effort where everybody was in some kind of competition and they had to be judged superior by some group of panelists that we don't know much about. So it was almost like the Olympics and we were all ice skaters and people were judging to see who was worthy to be in the esteemed spaces. And to some extent, Yale played an important role in with August Wilson and, and bringing August Wilson and championing August Wilson's work with Lloyd Richards for all those years. And that was the beginning of, you know, the, all those conversations of excellence versus inclusion, um, as though those things were mutually exclusive. Mm -hmm. And as Native people started to work in better resourced institutions, we had to, the decolonization was important because we would need cultural advisors. We would have elders both in the cast and people that were advising the show. And so there's a lot of power sharing that has to happen. It's not just the director or just the producer sort of sashaying in and saying, I'm the most important. And Jeannie and I have written about some of these projects that this processes of how a consultant works, how a cultural advisor works, how the elders position. And then when we start bringing things into rehearsal, like music and dance, you know, how does that work? What What's appropriate to share? What can we do in rehearsal space to kind of create community for the artists? And then, oh, we're not gonna share that with the public, but that's a process of learning. One time we were in Alaska and we wanted to learn some, we were learning Tlingit language for a show. And we said, well, we have a couple dances. And they were like, well, we barely have time to touch on the language. And I was like, well, if you have time, great. And they were like, okay, we all learned form drawing. And we had to learn the drawing principles for the artwork before we were allowed to think about dancing. Mm -hmm. We weren't doing form art line drawing anywhere in the play, but that was the way you learn. And so, you know, the, those things, producers need to ask questions early in the processes about what's necessary to do this work and then start to budget for it and create time for it and space. Um, maybe there's ceremony to make the space more comfortable for the artists. So, I mean, those things are all a piece of the creative process. And when Kinsale talks about community, 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 it's like, well, our little group is going to become its own community. And then we're not going to agree because we come from different places. So how do we sort through what our value system is? Mm -hmm. And that's all part of it. And, you know, Lort theaters are dealing with this from a number of underrepresented communities now of what the needs are. You know, there was this thought that we'll just let them in. We'll say they're good enough and we'll just open the doors and they can come in. And it's like, well, we, we need to create art. We need the processes and the support to actually make the art. So that's how I look at it. Delena, do you want to add anything? To that, I'm, I, I'm thinking about um, the way you've uh, talked about like magical realism as not being a genre that fully accounts for indigenous art making, even as Western audiences will be most familiar with a genre like that. And I think that speaks to what Randy and Conceal are talking about around audience expectations, around you know closed door processes. Um, so I, I'm curious about how you work to frame uh, these performances in your capacity as director. Thank you. Uh, so I always talk about Native history and the way we believe in things as being uh, different planes at the same time. Uh, we're all related. Everything is an ancestor. Uh, we are going to be ancestors at one point in our lives. And you'll see in a lot of Native writing, you'll see that concept, that value system. A lot of people equate it to magical realism, which always makes it seem like it's something outside of us. Mm -hmm. And it's not. Um, I always feel like that's a disservice. That's like calling um, our cosmology um, fables or mythologies. And so um, for me, magical realism, I, yeah, I shy away from it, but at the same time, I know that's what audience, when I see a need to play, that's the, where they go to immediately. But for us, we have, Time is not linear. Our stories go in circles. Um, our story structure is not like the Aristilian structure. 
And because that has been hammered in so hard and ingrained at the very educational level of what a play is, we have to break that cycle because that's not the way the original storytelling of this land that we're currently on, that's not how it was. And so we ease people into it. You know, it's, it's, I equate it to Shakespeare. And when people give me a hard time about um, the difficulties in teaching indigenous theater, I'm like, well, you teach Shakespeare and it's hard for them to understand the language, but we find a way to get through it. And so you just, the first 10 minutes is usually what it takes to warm somebody up and get them into that world. And the great thing about the native stories and the writers that we work with, and also whenever you just listen to them, is that they're all, they're universal. They may be specific to this tribe, but because they're so specific, that's what makes it a story that we can all relate to. We know those people on that stage and it humanizes us. And we get to tell the story the way we wanted to, the way we intended. And a lot, you know, that's one of the things I learned during the pandemic was people were afraid to do native theater. It was very scary to them. So, um, because they weren't really sure how to do it. They were afraid they'd make mistakes. And the truth is you will make a mistake. We all make mistakes for humans. That's what happens, but that doesn't stop you from moving forward. And through the virtual realm, we were able to have a lot of theaters see our short play festival, our festival of new plays. And so um, we had nine short plays in our uh, short play festival and seven of them received uh, commissions for full productions. And oh, so that wow. was something very unique that's never happened before. And of course, one of those situations or in all those situations, they were by theaters that have never done a native play because they weren't really sure how to go about it. And I've always stressed this about our communities and I don't wanna speak behalf on every native community, but I feel that we are a nice approachable people. And if you come with good heart and intention, we want to help you and guide you through the process. You know, if, if you show up in our community, you speak to our council, you go, to, you go sit with the elders, we will want to help you. And so one of the things we've been doing at Native Voices is we've been offering ourselves as that resource. If you wanna make a Native play, you wanna do more Native programming, you don't know how, please come to us and we'll, we'll, we'll help you. Mm -hmm. We may not have all the answers, but because, you know, as Kinsel and everyone in this conversation has said, our community, it's vast, but it's really small. My father would say, it's not, uh, you know how people say it's, it's, a, it's a small world. My father would say, it's not a small world, it's a big family. And that's what the native community is. It's one giant family. So I might know a cousin that knows a cousin and we can get you in contact with that person that you need and we can help you do things correctly. And so, you know, the great thing about indigenous storytelling and one of the things I'm really stressed upon and, you know, going back to the incarcerated youth and working, my, my experience working with native children um, is that our stories have power and our stories, our voices have power. And because of the assimilation process and the boarding school process, a lot of our people, our voices have been stifled. Mm -hmm. And so the only way we can take back our history is by telling it our way using our own voice. And it's a technique they use uh, in a lot of survivor uh, trainings like rape survivors and um, trauma survivors is how do you tell the story in your own words? Because at the heart of it, every story we tell is about medicine. It's medicine for me, it's medicine for the audience to hear it. It's, it's something important that needs to be shared. Even if it's a piece that leaves us broken when we walk away, it's, it makes us think about how we could do something different and be better. And so for me, every time we tell a story, we are, we're helping heal the world. I know that may sound really silly, but it's, it's the bomb our society needs right now. Oh, thanks, Delena. And that's such incredible news about the Short Play Festival and the successes of those playwrights. I'm so excited to see those. Um, I think I want to invite Lisa into this conversation. And I, I, I'm, I'm hearing some talk about the kind of care we need to take around these stories. Randy talking about what can be shared on stage and what happens off stage within these communities. And I know Lisa, you um, work really hard um, around protocols and have developed language for the Autry about um, how its materials will be used in consultation with um, tribal nations. And so I I'd love to hear you um, talk about how this plays out in your work, what this looks like on the archiving side of things. Randy's also mentioned that um, the world of theater is 
like 10 years behind the world of museums in this right. And so you are in a lot of ways, I think like adapting the protocols for museums in the world of theater. Um, so I, I'm just curious about what it what it's like to be in that position and, and um, what kind of work you're involved in with this regard. Um, thank you and, and thank you for inviting me. First of all, I'm, I'm not developing the protocols. Well, my, my, I mean, there's already protocols that were created over 10 years ago, Native American protocols for our, or uh, protocols for, you know, how archivists can work with Native American materials. And they were mostly made for institutions that were non-Native institutions. And what I've been concentrating is like, how can we implement this in a practical way in a sustainable way and something that tries to look at all the various angles um and it takes many hands and a long time so uh yeah i've been working on just trying to find other examples and leaning on other people and how they work with native communities and and make it sort of like a central area creating like a central place where people can see these examples and um i work cross-departmentally with other uh Autry staff to come up with language that says basically, you know, we understand there there are, you know, there's a level of care and steps we want to take when working with materials uh, created by Native communities. Um, and it would be like native communities, giving native communities the sovereignty and the authority to describe um, how and determine how they want their collections treated. So kind of just working with that, that really community-based thought. Um, and Native Voices Archives, luckily, is, is a little bit different because it was made. It was made for people like the theater was made for people for it to be shown right it's it's made to be shared um so that that's one um, wonderful thing about native voices and the archives because i remember when jean it i don't know how long it took jean to invite me to see the archives because she said she was embarrassed <laughs> i believe she was like ashamed and when i got to their house it was like beautiful rows of files and file folders and well organized and 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 loving care so when on this conversation where i hear you all talk about stories and intergenerational and like ancestry like that's i see that spirit inside like the native voices archives one of the great things in putting the women in the archives exhibit together is going back to um the Native Voices Archives and looking at all the videos and seeing Delena from like the early 2000s and following her and like watching the recordings for over a decade and then seeing, you know, some of the great writers that they've had um, that were women, a majority of women telling women's stories, meta women, one women shows, you know, this is a story about the people in my life. It's, it was amazing. And the subjects are, you know, time and memorial subjects like family and land, but also contemporary, right? Fracking. So technology, there was one that had so much foresight um, that it's like, wow, they wrote this 10 years ago about, you know, being able to work remotely from home so they could take care of their sick mother. And this was in 2002, 2012 or 10 years ago. So, um, yeah, I, I feel like working with what we try to do here at the Autry is work with the community first and take all the different uh, perceptions and thoughts and, and try to capture, you know, the various ways and when we're, how we can work with community. And I think Native Voices is a great example of that. They're just in throughout within <laughs> created by the community in which they're they're looking to um you know lift up so mm -hmm. i don't know if that answered your question <laughs> no it absolutely does and i guess as a follow-up question um you know so we've been talking about the pivot during the pandemic and part of the pivot has been um, adapting your in-person exhibits to these online exhibits, um, including the What's Her Story exhibition. Um, and 
I, I think what's so beautiful about that exhibition in particular is that you can see behind the scenes the ways that this community works, right? And the care that these creators are taking with one another. Um, and so I don't know if you have anything from that archive or that exhibition that you'd like to share with our audience, um, but <laughs> I, I invite a, everyone to look at it. It's beautiful. My background is actually from the physical, physical exhibit of the Native Voices section. It's a very small area, but it's uh, the one to, I think the, this way is, oh, you can't see my hand, is actually an email that was printed out and like redacted the email addresses. But one of the things that I love about this exhibit and that I found or I found about this archive is the development. So it, it just doesn't show like this play went up, here's the cast, here's the drum, you know, here, here's what happened when this play went up. We literally have folders that span many years that shows the development. So in one of the things in our exhibit, we show the development of um, the bird cage by Diane Glancy to get that right. So we okay. showed, you know, Diane talking about it in her interview and saying, this is what I'm thinking of. And then the reading to the final production and to, and that's all captured in the archives. And, and I always say like the Native Voices archives is so unique because it does capture this intense contextual information that, that just expands the story universe, right? Mm -hmm. um, so I enjoy very much um, going into these archives. This is, I'm not just saying this because I'm <laughs> here, but it is one of my favorite archives to look into and to delve into and examine because you're seeing, um, especially for women in the archives, because I got to know the women playwrights and actresses a little bit more vicariously. Um, and you just, you see their life, right? You see their life and you see their art and you see their humor as well as, you know, their, their, their message, their poignant messages as well. And it's, so I was, you know, in the pandemic, looking at these videos, crying and laughing within a day, um, looking at like four or five different videos. So that's beautiful. Um, we have about 15 minutes left and I want to remind our audience that they are more than welcome to share their questions in the chat um, and I'll relay them to our panelists. I see we have one that I, I'll get to in a moment, but while we're still on the topic of archives, um, I also know that for a lot of you in this room, archives are important to your creative process. It's not just about documenting the creative process itself, but it's drawing on archives in order to create new stories or tell stories in a new way. Um, Delena, I know in your one woman play, you are drawing on the Dawes roles. Um, you know, so so I, I and Kinsey, I know you've worked with archives to write your own poetry. So I, I would just love to hear about what it's like on the creative side to engage with archives, perhaps not, you know, um, controlled by tribal nations themselves. Um, yeah, anything you'd be willing to share about um, archival work in a creative capacity. I remember we used to have retreats where all the artists would be together, the playwrights, actors, and then we would like go to the library at the old Southwest Museum. I think it was called the Braun. And Kim Walters would sit us down and put gloves on us and say, I'm gonna let you touch something. and something that was very moving there were there uh lisa you can help me with this there are a, a couple of books that were drawn by the uh folks housed at the original boarding school uh which is fort marion uh it was a prisoner of war camp right after world uh, the civil war and you started to look at those ledger drawings from those artists and you realize there was a story. You, as you turn the pages, you could see the story pop. And from that, I became fascinated with the boarding schools. And then I was working on measure for measure, trying to figure out how to set it in the boarding schools and that became off the rails. And that was maybe like a seven year gestation from getting to touch those those articles from, you know, we're talking about 1860, I think is the date on those 1860s, right after the Civil War. And just thinking about how communication works mm -hmm. and trying to read and understand. I'm dyslexic. I was a 
from the country. The whole time I was in school, I always felt like, you know, a fish in mayonnaise, you know, it just, ne I never really quite felt at home or comfortable. And that was visceral by being in the archives. And, and not everybody gets to touch things, I know. Um, I don't want to imply that. But it, <laughs> it, it's amazing to be with that kind of intimacy of how someone's thinking. Yeah. And actually, I, I want I did have some students in here and they were asking, like, what's the difference from a museum and what's the difference from an archive? Because some of the objects are the same thing. And like, well, how did you interact? How did you react to interact with the things in the archives? And how did you interact with the things in the museum? And with the archives, you do get to touch, you do get to engage, you get to feel that vibration from something that happened before and I always like to say you can't tell a story without an archive mm -hmm. the story is always is always begat by something that happened before some sort of evidence oral history photograph you know um idea that you had before so it is exciting for me and I was there for that and that's the first time I was introduced to Native Voices I think I was fresh a fresh hire at the Autry less than a year and I just remember meeting all the artists and and you and Gina it's just odd. It's odd by it all. The, the thing that we got to do at the Southwest, in addition to going to the library, was going up in the tower. Um, and and uh, we would take uh, what we call day writers, uh, in addition to the playwrights that were official retreat writers. And so we'd have a, a group of 10 or 15 Native uh, artists, actor, writer, director combos. Um, and they'd get to go up in that tower. And I, and I know a lot of stories um, came out of that. Uh, Marie Clement's Tombs yeah. of Vanishing Indian. Uh, Diane Glancy was fascinated by the idea of barbed wire and how it was meant to keep people out and, 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 and what that story was. And um, so, so interacting with the, with the collection and the archive at, at the Autry, seeing the storyboards for upcoming exhibits, we would do that. We would go behind the scenes um, and, and see what part of the story is there and what part of the story is, is missing um, for this group of artists. So um, it was our, our connection to the Autry um, was so serendipitous and wonderful and happened at just the right time. Um, I wanna mention uh, John Gray, who was so gracious and wonderful bringing us in early on. Uh, Scott Kratz, um, who was uh, in charge of us for quite some time early on. David Burton, uh, who was in development and raised the early funding uh, for what we were doing. And we, we were doing odd things. Randy talked about bringing all of the artists together. We would, you know, we went to um, uh, Occidental, Occidental College. College. And we all lived on the campus together for, for 10 days. And when we were putting that budget together, <laughs> David was like, we can't house and feed people for 10 days. I said, well, yeah, that's what we need to do. Um, and Kalani needs to come in and teach a movement class. And we need to go to the Southwest. So it was um, community, uh, what, what Kinsale said earlier as well. Just putting all of those wonderful, delightful uh, artists with all of their stories in the same room. Um, Diane Glancy has a saying that uh, your story shakes loose my story and my story shakes loose Delena's story. And, and that's how we tell stories. So it was, it was, it's been great. I, I miss it. I miss my boxes. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, the, all of those ancestors uh, are still here up here with me in what I call the tower but um they also went to you in the come box. come Gina, <laughs> come. Yeah. I'll let you roll the halls archivist yeah <laughs> um, um I see we have a question oh Kinsale go ahead yeah, and then I'll turn to I just wanted to answer the initial question um I think also in terms of just different types of storytelling and archive I think what a lot of people here at Yale, there's a lot of native students here who are concerned with like archive and storytelling and even like questioning and disrupting what an archive is and how to engage with it. I think um, certainly I've been thinking the last couple of years about um, specifically with native theater, how conversations about archive have started or have been around since like what American theater emerged from or what natives role in American theater started as. 
Um, and there's like a few different examples that I'm thinking of. And so for one, like the use of archive in a way and, and like how native performance artists or their work themselves has been categorized in American theater. Mm -hmm. um, I'm thinking of playwrights like Molly and Donna who like disrupt how native uh, kind of performers have been categorized in the past. Um, so I don't know, I, I think this starts with like native performance and storytelling and what we know now as American theater um, has existed Natives in American theater kind of started in projects of erasure and during moments of containment and um, displacement. And so some of the earliest forms of performance that we see in like American theater were largely expository or putting native peoples on display. Um, and even the most successful storytellers in like the early 20th century, which is when native performance and theater really emerges in the mainstream is like Emily Pauline Johnson. And, you know, even though she had a space where she could tell stories, her performance was always for a predominantly white audience who was viewing her through this lens of fascination and kind of like a salvage narrative. Like this is a disappearing culture and we're seeing it, you know, in person in this very special setting. And that was at the same time in the early 20th century, an intense time of displacement and violence. And so these playwrights like Molly and Donna who explores like Molly Spotted Elk who was very similar to Emily Pauline Johnson. Um, a lot of people are looking back into how, you know, these performers themselves were archived, how they were treated. And I think that also brings up the question of archive not as, you know, a static object or a static thing. It's really, you know, reaching across generations to relatives that have come before us in this long geneal genealogy of storytelling and native theater. And so for me, I guess, navigating as like a poet, but also, you know, a playwright, a storyteller, a performer, how do you bring that into your creative process? And how do you pay homage to those performers who came before? How do you treat things that are categorized as archives by anthropologists or certain writers respectfully and as relatives? And um, I'm also thinking of Jeremy Ducher, who we actually, and Professor Hickey in our class you taught last year, we kind of witnessed like um, their process and how, they viewed their um, revitalization of music in their native language as reaching across generations to kind of revitalize the voices of their ancestors that were contained in wax cylinders by anthropologists and their project of treating archives as relatives and how to question the use of archives in general. Mm -hmm. I think this also connects to audience too, like what, this is what um, I think everybody else has been talking about, but like being culturally conscious and conscious of what you share with audiences and who your audience is made up of. So, you know, for example, like in uh, my research also for Melon Mays here has to do with poetry and, you know, different genealogies of po native poetry over time. And some of that, you know, is, is boarding school poetry. So poetry that was written by students who were, you know, taken from their families and were in boarding schools. And that is its own school of work. It's its own archive, but, you know, leaving that to the students and families that, that, that the boarding schools affected and, you know, who those poems belong to is a matter of respect. And just knowing how, you know, as relatives who had suffered and who, you know, wrote their own work and were persevering in some regard or seeing themselves, you know, creating their own distinct narratives. How do you also treat those with respect and not put those on display, you know, and how do you not exploit trauma like that? Mm -hmm. um, I think those are a lot of questions that I've been thinking about when it comes to archive and a number of realms of storytelling. And yeah, I appreciate hearing what everyone has to say too, because it's definitely a matter of um, still hearing how like, you know, it functions today in theater and poetry and how artists continue to interrogate and explore what archive even means in the first place. Thanks, Kinsale. That was, yeah, I'm glad you were able to share that. We um, we have a few questions in the chat. We're not going to have time to get to all of them. I'm so sorry because they're brilliant questions. I, I want to voice Lori Arnold here, though. She says, as a Native historian, I'm grateful for Native playwrights and theater makers. I used the 2022 NVA short plays in class last week, and the plays brought home many of the concepts we've been discussing all semester. Theater is an overlooked space for public history. But as you have each noted, audiences experience real transformation from hearing these stories. Oh, I'm getting shivers. Thank you, everyone, for the amazing work you do and I can't wait to get to the NBA archives. So not a question, just a lot of praise. And I also encourage our audience members to watch that short play festival. It is incredible and such a gift to be able to tune in um, even if you're not in the LA area. Um, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll get to one more question in the time we have remaining. So Karina Chang says, can you talk about the powerful impact of Off the Rails at Oregon Shakespeare Festival, the reception by Native communities and by OSF audiences who might not otherwise get to see the play with a Native perspective? That one's for you, Randy. 
I was thinking about that. I think maybe something that's really unique about that particular production that wound up in the script is the spirit, the, the, the grandfather now is written to be played by someone who is a representative of local culture where the play is produced. So we had a local cultural leader and a noted powwow performer from that region come in and be uh, play the elder, the grandfather. And one of my favorite moments of that play was his family came to see opening. And we used some of his family songs, which they had given us permission to use in the finale. And when the actors started singing, the audience stood up and sang back to the stage. There were like 50 of his family members there and they knew the songs and it was breathtaking. And it was more like going to an athletic event because people were just cheering. Like when some athlete does something, you think, how did they do that? And so the idea of, that's what I mean by empowering artists, having that particular connection for that community. We're native performers, you know, Delano was one of the first few native performers on stage at Oregon Shakespeare Festival, mm -hmm. just a few years before. Mm -hmm. And so to see a, a whole, piece that was indigenized and had the power of the whole company and was a very diverse audience uh, uh, cast and you know actors from that show you know one is playing across from Leonardo DiCaprio in a film that's going to come out very soon there's a show called Ghosts on CBS and that native characters from that production Sean Taylor Corbett's play Distant Thunder had uh, just had a production so having the visibility of a large production in a significant theater lifted those artists in other endeavors they wanted to follow. Mm -hmm. And that's what we have to do is give people a platform where they show the rest of what they can do, what they're capable of. Mm -hmm. And don't ask, what do I learn about being native by mm -hmm. watching this play? Mm -hmm. It's like, what do you learn about being human by watching any beautifully done piece of art. 